All right. Thank you for joining today, everyone. Um, I'm Savannah Sullivan, the Climate Policy Director at Green Umbrella, and we're really excited for today's event, Equitable Community Engagement for Climate Action. This is the third webinar in our Regional Climate Action Lunch and Learn series. And today we're fortunate to be joined by Groundwork Ohio River Valley, and we'll be describing the types of equity, some general principles of community engagement, and a local climate advisory group model that was collaboratively developed uh, through the Climate Safe Neighborhoods Partnership. And so the climate policy program at Green Umbrella, we work to foster coordination across our regional institutions and local governments in their communities on sustainability and policy and elevate these needs to state and federal philanthropic opportunities to draw on resources. We have four primary goals for this work in our 10 county region and today we'll be focusing on goal number two, centering equity and planning processes. And we are currently working through two sets of programming to tackle this goal. One is through our participation in the Urban Equity Climate Compact hosted by the Institute for Sustainable Communities. And you can learn more about that um, in our very first webinar that we hosted in this series. And the second is through designing and supporting community engagement processes that suit our local needs and context here in Greater Cincinnati. And to that end, we've been part of the Climate Safe Neighborhoods Partnership to kickstart the work in the region. And before we get started on that, and before I dig in, I first wanted to introduce the types of equity and some principles connected to equitable community engagement. First is recognition. So this means identifying and acknowledging injustices affecting specific populations. This means accounting for stakeholder norms, values, and expertise. And I like to think of this as asking, what is the context and how are problems being characterized and communicated, including historical information, data, current resident experiences, and more. And as shown in the image to the right, this really is the roots or the foundation of doing equitable work. Next is procedural equity, uh, which is addressing power structures and access to participation in decision making. And a key to this is ensuring inclusive and meaningful engagement and asking how our engagement actually shifts power, builds trust, and ensures accountability, both structurally and intergenerationally. And we'll have more on this on the next slide. But the distributional equity component, so the leaves of our tree, so that's what we're producing. This means how are we addressing the actual distribution of burdens and benefits across different populations? And I like to think of this as asking, what are the projects and the programs we're creating? What policies are we implementing in communities? And do they include the language and the mechanisms? And really, do they address the outcomes to achieve equity? Last but not least is transformative equity. So addressing the structural conditions while facilitating repair, cultivating accountability and reducing harm. And I like to think of this as asking, how are we shifting the culture around doing this work? And, you know, to build on this tree image, you know, what does the forest look like? How are we interacting with other trees? So some quick principles on procedural equity before we dig in on the model. Um, a really important part is centering equity um, from the get-go, from the outset of doing any type of planning and implementation initiatives. That really has to be one of the first conversations that happens in local government and community projects for this really to be a meaningful part of the work. Next is, taking some time to really think about how we're supporting empowered communities. So that doesn't mean just showing up and telling communities what to do, how to do it. It means working with communities, listening to their needs and working together collaboratively to, to co-create a, a vision and a process for tackling this. And this really important part of this is incorporating firsthand knowledge of community members in any plans or projects that are developed Next is engaging effectively. So this is achieving both breadth, you know, talking to a lot of people, but also depth, really connecting with people uh, in such a way to, to learn about what are their daily lives, what are the climate impacts they're experiencing, what are the resources that their communities um, might be missing, and creating open spaces for that dialogue. 
being accountable and transparent is a really important part of this work. Um, and this includes outreach, continuous engagement and evaluation mechanisms. And then building social cohesion, what that means is how are we building relationships in a broad coalition? What are the partnerships? You know, we're not just alone in this work and how can we incorporate cultural and social activities into engagement processes? And so there are some tools that we're gonna share after the webinar and the follow-up email um, from the Georgetown Climate Center connected to this work, not only for engagement, but how can it connect to project and budgeting uh, processes for local governments and communities. And then what types of data metrics and monitoring systems um, can you begin incorporating uh, to support the sort of follow-up on this work as well. So without further ado, uh, introducing the climate advisory group model. And so this is what our guests will be digging in on today, but first wanted to give a bit of background on how this whole thing got started. What it is, is basically a focus group um, in neighborhoods to understand what climate impacts are and then co-create solutions to address them. And this got started almost two years ago um, through some conversations with Green Umbrella, Groundwork Ohio River Valley, the city of Cincinnati, and really curious about how we could um, create more equitable engagement processes in the city of Cincinnati. And so this work was supported by the National League of Cities, uh, a resilience Resilient Communities Grant. And we modeled our first discussions around this off of this guide here, a guide to community-centered engagement in District of Columbia. It's a great resource. We'll also be including that in the follow-up email to this webinar. And this led to the creation of the Climate Safe Partnership, which you'll be hearing about in a second, which is comprised of Ground Ripple High River Valley, Green Umbrella, City of Cincinnati, and the University of Cincinnati. And I'd now like to introduce Sophie Revis from Ground Rock Ohio River Valley. She is the Climate Resilience Director, as well as Margot Roberts, who is <clears throat> who was a Bond Hill and Roselawn um, community resident advisor, and is now a community organizer through Ground Rock Ohio River Valley implementing on this work. So Sophie, I will pass it to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Savannah. Um, so yeah, as Savannah said, I'm Sophie Revis, I'm Climate Resiliency Director at Groundwork, and I lead the Climate Safe Neighborhoods Partnership. Um, next slide. So the Climate Safe Neighborhoods Partnership is a national program through Groundwork USA, um, and it's basically about ensuring equity in climate planning by elevating residents and ensuring equitable adaptation strategies are distributed to the communities who need it most. So the three goals are to explore and communicate the relationship between the climate crisis and racial and social injustices. Second is to build the capacity of residents to self-advocate and uh, for more equitable distribution of resources to arm them with the tools they need to do that work. And then to develop and implement short-term mitigation measures for climate impacts. And so the map on the left is a redlining map from another city in the network. It's a practice that basically prevented people of color from investing in homes, which caused lasting economic inequity that mirrors environmental inequity. We have reason to believe that Cincinnati was redlined as well, but we don't have the map. So we have had to look at data to understand how climate impacts are just disproportionately affecting communities of color and low-income communities in Cincinnati and so that we can identify them and focus efforts there. Um, next slide. And so I'll talk through some of the data that we use to identify those communities, but there are many more um, maps and information that you can look at on our website at groundworkorv.org. So this map shows land surface temperature. Um, the red areas are places uh, where the surface of the earth is hotter than average. Uh, extreme heat is a climate impact that is impacting Cincinnati. So we use this to identify areas that are more vulnerable to extreme heat. Um, next slide. So this is a percent of households in poverty. We also use socioeconomic data to understand which neighborhoods in the city have fewer resources to handle climate impacts like extreme heat, flooding, and air pollution. And next slide, please. Um, so what's unique is that we combined these sets of data to create 
indexes. This is our uh, heat vulnerability index, um, where we combine the land surface temperature and households and poverty to identify the most vulnerable neighborhoods in the city using that data. And so next slide. So after we have identified those communities, we get to start working to engage those uh, neighborhoods. Um, but that data is not enough to develop sustainable mitigation strategies. And that is why community engagement is so crucial. Um, no one understands a community better than the people living there. And that is why groundwork with Green Umbrella, University of Cincinnati, and the City of Cincinnati Office of Environment and Sustainability developed this climate advisory group model. So the CAG is made up of paid resident members who can define the unique issues and assets in their community. And the pilot was in Lower Price Hill, um, which is that center picture. And the second was in Bond Hill and Roselawn, which we recently completed. And so the CSN team um, provides in-depth information about climate change, mitigation strategies, and we also have the capacity to develop a plan. But the collaboration with residents and the CSN team allows for an in-depth understanding of climate impacts in the neighborhood and how to adapt to them and the best ways to adapt to them. I want to mention that the involvement of OES is critical as it's extremely important for policymakers to understand the resident perspective, especially in communities that have been left out by uh, the environmental movement and planning activities um, from a city level. Um, the main goal of the CAG is to elevate and arm residents with the tools for change, but another goal is the education of those who can enact changes in the system. Um, next slide, please. So the CAG, we cover a lot of things, do a lot of activities. We start with neighborhood context, uh, understanding how the neighborhood got to look the way it does through historic policies. Um, and cultural shifts, uh, the specific issues and assets within the communities. Um, and we also talk about climate change in general, the specific change impacts in Cincinnati and the neighborhood itself. Since the impacts in Cincinnati and cities across the country are disproportionate from neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, we also talk about ways to mitigate those climate impacts. And we also, early on, we see what these, the unique issues are and what the residents want to hear more about. So we invite guest presenters to talk more about, for example, one big issue in um, Bond Hone Roselawn was housing. So we invited guest speakers to talk more about housing stability. And we also do a mapping activity to talk more about or to show the specific impacts in that neighborhood. So we have like that city level data, but the resident experience can really show us the, on a granular level, where things are being impacted. Like where is most flooding happening? Which are areas that are extremely hot? What are uh, things that we're missing from that, like noise pollution? Um, and from there, we talk about ways to mitigate those. Um, you know, tree planting is a very popular mitigation strategy, but we also talk about developing green space, models for food access, um, complete streets, and uh, housing co-ops, things that can really answer what the community is facing and also make it more climate resilient. Um, this, one of the final ways we talk, we show this to the community at large is through the community showcase. Um, the CAG members invite community members from their, uh, from the neighborhood to see what the work we've been doing is, learn more about the impact of climate change in the neighborhood. Um, we also invite uh, politicians, policymakers to see what residents care about, what are the things that they want to see done. And I would like to pass it off to um, my coworker, Margo, to talk more about this process. Well, hello everybody, really excited to be a part of this and hope everyone's having a wonderful Wednesday. One of the pieces that we worked on in our climate advisory group 
was the Bond Hill and Rose Line Resilience Statement. And as you can see stated, it was an opportunity for all of the residents that participated within this group to really get together and think about what was important to our community and how we wanted to be accountable for what was happening next. I really enjoyed this piece because not only did it take out the, the great pieces, but also the challenges that we're having within our community and then holding us accountable for what was to happen next. So uh, really being in tuned and just personal uh, community engagement within our sister neighbor, uh, sister community, but also just seeing how we can empower ourselves and making different decisions and how this resilient statement helped us think about the other webbing that we could do and in intermingling some of our of our thoughts about other projects that could happen. So this was, a, I think, a really key component on how to move forward and thinking about what we could do. And it also was something else to be able to share with the community to ignite some of that need for others to get involved and participate and understand the need for the things that we had in our community. So I just think that it's a, it was a great piece of just really having conversations and different dialogues started to think about what our future can be within the neighborhood. So just a fantastic opportunity and having it geared to, so it wasn't just for any neighborhood, this was totally catered to our neighborhood and that makes a major difference. So everything just totally put together for us and by us. So wonderful thing to just be able to be a part of. Thanks, Margo. Um, so yeah, this flowchart shows how the CAG model works. There's a lot going on here. So I just wanna point out a few things. Um, first, that community concerns are constantly at the center of the conversation. For example, when we were talking in Bond on Roselawn about community issues, one thing that came up was the lack of community events that brought people together and made the community more tight-knit and supportive of each other. Um, that's not something data can show, not something a map can show. So that's one example of how important it is to have these conversations and include things that one might not think are related to climate. And so that lack of community events is something that when it came to mitigation strategies, we sought to develop solutions that could bring people together. For example, if we wanted to improve one of the parks in Bond Hill, how can we make it so that this is an opportunity for folks to talk to each other again and build that sense of community? And that's just one way that we have been um, tying these community concerns into adaptation strategies. Um, so again, the second goal of climate safe neighborhoods is to, to build the capacity of residents to self advocate for more equitable distribution of resources. That is why one of the products is a climate resilience plan, which is a neighborhood level resilience plan um, that is an actionable roadmap for climate resilience. Um, to make that the residents, you know, we talked a lot about different adaptation strategies and they took them and placed them on a map. And that is um, one way that we arm residents because that is going to be adopted by the community councils and can then be used for pursuing funding. Um, next slide, please. Oh, so yeah, this on the right is an example of um, the Lower Price Hill Climate Resilience Plan shows proposed trees, uh, different green roofs, green spaces, and things like that, that the community wants to see and where. Um, next slide. And so in Lower Price Hill, we are working to plant uh, 39 street trees. This is scheduled to be in fall 2022. Um, the community identified these on the map and we geolocated them and we're, are working with urban forestry to get them planted. Um, next slide. And so street trees are just one part of the tree planting solution. And so we've also been planting in places that are outside of the urban forestry uh, right of way. Um, so a lot of tree planting on private property and 
we've also been working to renew vacant lots to make them more uh, beautiful and valuable uh, to the community. And I want to mention that, you know, trees can answer other community needs. Um, for example, if food access is an issue, we can plant fruit trees as a small part to help fix that problem. Um, next slide. And so another thing that we are doing in Lower Price Hill that we're hoping to grow across the city is develop is implementing an air quality sensor network. Um, folks in Lower Price Hill have been concerned about air quality for a very long time. So we have been working to um, install these uh, purple air monitors across the uh, neighborhood so we can get a better sense of how air quality is um, affecting the neighborhood and areas for targeted mitigation that can be the most efficient use of resources to reduce air pollution in the neighborhood. And that's a live map that you can see at purpleair.com if you're interested in exploring it more. Um, next slide. Uh, so yeah, we've done a lot of great work so far um, and we're just going to continue working with more neighborhoods in the future. And I'm really excited that we're getting into the Beacon Corridor. Um, this is, you know, obviously much bigger area than what we've done before. It encompasses South Cumminsville, Millvale, North and South Fairmont, as well as English Woods. Um, this is another neighborhood that has disproportionate climate impacts. And so right now we are in the recruiting residence stage. Um, this Beekman Corridor Climate Advisory Group will start uh, May 24th. So if you would like to get involved, if you know folks who live there, maybe you live there and you wanna be a part of the Climate Advisory Group, um, please contact me at um, srevis at groundworkrv.org. I can put that in the chat later, but we would love to have as many people involved as possible. And, you know, maybe, you want to present to the Climate Advisory Group on solutions that your organization has, and that would be awesome as well. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Savannah. Hey, thank you so much, Sophie and Margo. Um, never gets old to me seeing these maps and pictures of the implementation projects that are starting to happen. Um, so before we wrap up and have the optional Q&A session um, from 12.30 to 1. We first wanted to talk about some additional next steps for how this work is going to be expanding and connecting across the region. Um, things that uh, Green Umbrella, Groundwork, and other partners are, are working towards and we'd love to get y'all involved in. Um, first, as Sophie mentioned, is we're still going to keep plugging away on Cincinnati neighborhoods. Um, one thing we really wanted to emphasize is how this model, which was collaboratively developed, has now been adopted by the city and is going to be a key element of the 2023 Green Cincinnati Plan update process. Uh, it is building on a climate equity indicators report that was completed last year. Uh, you can see that and all of the data and fund maps on the city's website. Uh, another way you can get involved right now with the Green Cincinnati Plan update process is taking action um, by clicking this blue button when you go to the uh, city's website to complete a climate change survey, as well as submit your ideas for climate change strategies that could be incorporated into our next Green Cincinnati Plan. And the city will be announcing and launching their um, community engagement sessions in June 2022. So just keep an eye out for that. We'll be announcing it from our organizations as well as you can find all that information on the city's website. And you can just contact Ollie Croner, the sustainability manager there for more information. Another thing we wanna really emphasize is that this is a model that has been developed for um, not just Cincinnati, but has big, is prepared to address communities outside of Cincinnati. And so we've been in conversations as a partnership to explore how we can bring this across our 10 county region. And are currently in 
working to allocate resources in order to do so. Um, we have worked to connect this to what the Regional Climate Collaborative um, can provide for regional communities. And so we've heard from so many different local governments and so many residents from across this 10 county region that they want strategies and tools for how to engage community residents. And so we hope to begin facilitating those conversations and sharing resources, not only through the climate advisory group, but additional toolkits from across uh, national organizations and more um, with folks like yourselves. So to that end, um, save these upcoming dates because more information um, and opportunities to engage are coming. So next, of course, is the continuation of our Lunch and Learn series here. Uh, our next session will focus on climate change and the impacts on housing and what are some solutions to create more resilient housing in Greater Cincinnati. And that will feature guests home Cincinnati. And uh, another key event we encourage everyone to get involved with is the Midwest Regional Sustainability Summit. It's a one day event happening um, at the Cintas Center at Xavier University on Thursday, June 16th. Our keynote speaker, Kristen Baja, is the Resilience Director for the Urban Sustainability Directors Network and will be featuring uh, local governments, uh, will be featuring community residents, um, tackling all sorts of issues across the climate spectrum. And it should be a really fun event. We also have in-person uh, field trips that are tied to the conference as well. And last but not least, uh, the Regional Climate Collaborative, the thing we keep talking about in these webinars, um, is finally scheduled for its launch in July. So July 21st, uh, more information will be coming uh, later this month about that, but it will be a big launch event with partners uh, and it will also be connected to our green drinks. And so there will be some information, but also some fun uh, where we can meet and hang out outdoors in person over a couple drinks. And so with that, we're going to wrap up and open it up for questions um, from any of you. So feel free to drop them in the chat or um, can come off mute and ask any questions, but I do wanna encourage you to reach out to me if you have any questions about this work, if you want to get involved with this work. Um, we are so excited to keep plugging away and ensuring that equity can be centered in the work that's happening across the region. Great. So yeah, feel free to chat. Um, we do actually have one question that um, is coming in, and this is actually for Margot. Um, so I'll ask that, and then Margot, if you can come off mute and answer. But folks are interested in hearing more about um, your experience as a climate uh, advisory group community resident advisor and your work now as a community organizer. What does that look like? And um, what are your ideas for connecting with other neighborhoods outside of Bond Hill and Roselawn in the future? Absolutely. Um, well, it was a great opportunity to start. It was a six week program as far as being a part of the climate advisory group and just uh, able to really connect with some substantial information and be educated about things that were actually some issues that were with going on within our community and uh, taking the time to really establish what the goals were. Um, and then it, it, to find out that the opportunity turned into uh, being able to stay grounded within my neighborhood, which I think is just a wonderful, uh, it's not only a privilege, but a great opportunity to give into the into the community that I reside in. And like I said, it's also because I'm a resident of Bond Hill. So I always try to uh, connect with my other community saying it's the sister neighborhood as far as Roseline. So now with being the community uh, organizer, really delving into new relationships, more importantly with Roseline, uh, then having conversations with the, with the parks, with urban forestry, 
So trying to get them out to come to the community council meetings and just be able to talk to the, the community about urban forestry, how it affects our neighborhood and seeing the positive pieces about everybody becoming engaged in that. Um, just really starting to network and uh, get people involved. And it's uh, one of the most critical pieces to what I do, but it's extremely exciting. And uh, I think it's a great help make to move forward in just doing work. And uh, another great part is just being able to connect with other neighborhoods. I think to just have, again, as we talk about a collaborative, uh, working with each other's information to see how we can utilize that in different neighborhoods. So just a real work in progress, but really exciting about what to see it happens in the future. Hey, thank you so much, Margo. Um, our next question comes from Dina in Norwood, and this is for you, Sophie. So is the urban forestry program a city department or consultant? And what program did you use to locate tree locations? If you could, yeah, share the details about your data dashboard as well. Yeah, so urban forestry is a part of Cincinnati Parks. Um, so it is a city department. Um, and for the locate tree locations. So for the community mapping activity, we handed out paper maps. Uh, that folks mar marked on. And then we digitize those using um, ArcGIS. Since we are fortunate to have an ArcGIS professional on our staff. Um, and then from there, we uh, beautified it, made it more aesthetically pleasing in, um, what is it? Adobe. And I also want to mention that we uh, used an actual GPS to walk around the neighborhood and make sure that those locations were extremely accurate for planning, um, planting. Great. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, the next question is also from Dana in Norwood. And this question I'll pitch to first you, Sophie, and then um, if Margo has anything to add. Um, was a resilient statement a product of the whole session? How many sessions? If you guys could tag team the sort of development process of the resilient statement, because it was iterative. <laughs> yeah, so it was something that all of the members participated in from the first meeting on. And as the as new information was presented and as uh, more issues came to the surface, uh, it was changed. Um, basically as part of like every homework to like edit the resilience statement and behind the scenes, my team would like combine everyone's input to make it uh, inclusive of everyone's input. Margo, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, not too much. I guess I was just gonna touch on that part as far as, far as the homework and um, that I think was a critical part to seeing what we needed to do next. And then I guess, you know, just thinking about that resilient statement, it really pushed the, the measures of looking at the community and seeing the, the great parts. And then again, just seeing what we needed to move forward with help and then holding to it. So always revisiting it. I feel like every session we had, we still revisited, like Sophie said, being able to, as we continued into the, into the group, looking at it, seeing how it could be revised and whether it was something that could be added and just moving from there. But I really in, I really enjoyed it. And I think it also helps us create relationships with each other, especially with having two different neighborhoods to see the relationship of what we had in common and what we could learn from each other, but still coming together as a cohesive piece to see and hey, this is what we can work on and this is what we can move forward with. Thank you so much, Sophie and Margo. Um, to answer Chris's question that he just sent, um, where can we find the reports um, compiled about the work that has happened so far? So I did drop a link into the Climate Safe Neighborhoods dashboard. I'll also just show it really quick um, on the share screen. Um, so you can see here that 
Lower Price Hill, in Roselawn and Bond Hill, you can click through, um, which I'll do in a second, for um, seeing the whole process and the whole story of what engaging at the neighborhood level looks like. And we also have a citywide dashboard. So first, you can scroll through here and see the whole story on the background, the history of, you know, what has happened in that neighborhood historically. You can also see here about the formation of their, at that point, they were called equity advisory groups, but we did switch to uh, calling them climate advisory groups, but you can learn about the recruitment and then the actual implementation of the advisory group, and then the implementation of projects themselves um, since then. And you can also see uh, the whole dashboard um, that Groundwork has pulled amazing data into. Um, you don't have to sign into GIS to see them, um, or maybe you do now. Yeah, I oh, no. <laughs> spotted this issue this morning. We're working on fixing that. It should be up and running again soon. Okay. Um, yeah, it kind of booted me off, but soon fixed. And what you'll be able to see is not only the um, data that Sophie shared about heat, flooding, and other physical environment characteristics. You can also see the social and economic data points as well and see the indices that they've compiled um, in order to understand vulnerability at the neighborhood level. Um, it's awesome. I look at it all the time. Um, so, yes. Um, are there any other questions? I don't see any more in the chat, so feel free to come off mute. Um, if you have any other questions you want to ask. Uh, hi, I, I was trying to type one. Um, uh, yeah, this, this is John Calhoun. I, I'm with uh, Faith Communities Go Green, um, and I'm also trying to start a creation care green team uh, for my congregation. Uh, so I've been trying to look for opportunities for volunteering around environmental justice and equity. And I just wondered if, if um, y'all have any recommendations? Is there any sorts of volunteering for congregations coming out of this work? Will they be shared with the Faith Communities Go Green? Things like that. Great. Thank you so much for joining, John. Um, I definitely can throw out a couple of things, but I'll let Sophie and Margo um, throw out their ideas first. Cool. Yeah, we're right now working on get, like identifying projects um, in Bond Hill and Roseland, and I'm sure those will be available to volunteers. And we usually have them updated on our website and in our newsletter. Um, and on the Green Umbrella uh, events page. So definitely projects in Bond Hill and Roselawn. Um, we sometimes have projects in East Westwood and Lower Price Hill as well. So um, they're kind of, they aren't like, um, you know, regularly scheduled, you know, every second Tuesday of May every year. So it would be great to uh, sign up for updates from us at Groundwork RV. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll, I think I've already signed up for newsletters. I'll, I'll try to keep an eye out. Thanks. Yeah, and oh, I know Margot has something in the works as well. I think that really what's been helpful for me is just reaching out into some of not only our community councils and you know becoming uh, in a part of their agendas and just reaching out that way. Also connecting with different businesses and to collaborate. Uh, one of the biggest things that I've tried to do is because I work as a community ambassador on top of being a community organizer, having those connections to working and partnering with other pieces like beautification committees, um, but being able to grow the masses. And I would probably recommend too, if there are any other um, communities or churches or you know what congregations that may be within your community that are on that may have the same opportunity to work and volunteer to doing it together because I find that being in the masses and not just having to try to do it on your own makes it a lot easier and then you're able to gain more individuals for the next time you want to do an event or just working to work it put something else into a, a work in progress. Great. 
Thank you so much, Sophie and Margot. Um, the only other thing I will add, um, John, to this is that for the Faith Communities Go Green, I think there will definitely be an opportunity to get engaged with the Regional Climate Collaborative. Um, we will be convening different stakeholder groups of which I think faith communities absolutely um, are one in order to inform what should the priorities be? Um, what are some important projects? Um, and how can you work together with local governments and community residents? Not only in Cincinnati, I know we're talking about Cincinnati neighborhoods right now, um, but the Regional Climate Collaborative will serve that 10 county region. So if you have congregations uh, that are in different jurisdictions, um, it'll be a great way to connect with local government leaders um, who work on these issues, um, who are trying to develop you know, whether it be green infrastructure or flooding uh, pro related projects or energy related projects that um, perhaps your congregation facility um, could take advantage of. I know, for example, um, you know, we've worked closely with um, the village of Silverton um, recently on a big solar uh, engagement opportunity to get not only their local government um, facilities better you know prepared for increased solar adoption but also residents and other businesses and organizations um, across the region it was while it was led by Silverton, it wasn't just for Silverton that was called their solar now program. Um, and so there are programs you know like this across our region led by different governments. Um, but we want to create a space for different groups such as yourself to better connect with what's happening at the programmatic and policy level. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out to me um, to learn more about that. I think the next um, main thing for to, um, to be able to join for that will be the launch event on July 21st, but absolutely happy to, to talk more before then. Um, great. Our next question comes from Gianna. Um, question for Sophie, how long have you been in your job position and how did you get started? Um, thanks, Gianna. I have been in my job position for two years as Climate Resiliency Director. I got started at Groundwork um, about four-ish years ago as an intern and I just stuck with it and um, was flexible and adaptable to whatever they needed me to do until an opportunity came along to um, start climate safe neighborhoods in the city. And so because of um, the rapport I had built up, that opportunity was offered to me. But yeah, I started as an intern in college. Such an awesome trajectory. Um, you could see in the presentation, you know, Sophie's profile picture, she's holding a chainsaw, she really does do it all. She does the, you know, resilience work and she does the on the ground implementation. <laughs> um, Margo, I would love if you could answer the same question because um, you have a great background as well. And um, we were so excited when you got involved with the climate advisory group. Oh, well, I think, um, my goodness, it was really interesting. I guess how it really how I got involved. Uh, I am the CEO and founder of a community organization uh, on the Go Enrichment. And I was out doing some just <clears throat> canvassing for volunteers to do a cleanup that I do bi monthly. And I actually connected with Kelsey uh, Hawkins <clears throat> Johnson about another initiative that she was working on. And we just stayed in contact and actually had another travel around the sun when there was an opportunity with the climate advisory group. And I was able to <clears throat> make a, uh, to be a liaison with trying to get that information out to the community. And once that happened, I became a part of the, the group. And then there was uh, another chance where there was a community organi organizer uh, position that became available. And I was really excited about it because I just love the community and I love doing stuff for environmental justice. And so went through the process and now we're here. So it's, uh, it's been exciting. Like, you know, you think about how just one thing can happen and then it 
rolls into something totally big. So it's just a, a great new track, great new change and wonderful way to start the spring season. Awesome. Thank you so much, Margo. Um, I also would be remiss if I didn't um, plug and highlight the Public Allies Program, because I see we have Ellery Overcast on the line as well. Um, Ellery is currently a public ally for the City of Cincinnati in their Office of Environment and Sustainability, and she's been working with us um, on our programming, um, the Climate Advisory Group process included, and um, I wanted to shout that out and share that. That's also how I got started in this work locally um, was through the Public Allies Program in the same Office of Environment and Sustainability as well as uh, an internship with Green Umbrella. Um, and so, yeah, there are a lot of great ways to plug in. And um, Ellery, do you have anything you wanna share about your Public Ally Program right now? Yeah, thanks so much. That I would fully agree. Um, Kelsey Hawkins Johnson was <clears throat> also the person who um, I learned about this from LinkedIn from a lot of previous public allies, and they're doing incredible work around environmental justice um, and knitting together this crazy network of powerful um, action and climate change. Um, and justice building. So it's really awesome to, I guess that's what I'm awesome to see this. And um, there, you guys highlighted it earlier, but, um, or you all highlighted it earlier about the Green Cincinnati plan um, update. And so just encourage people to um, definitely look out for the communications from, um, from Green Umbrella's climate policy, Green Umbrella's a newsletter and Groundworks newsletter around um, those opportunities and I'll drop in the chat the, the links to the climate um, recommendation surveys that um, are receiving input throughout the whole process and then those public meetings that are coming. Um, and then I'll, um, public allies also renews annually. So um, they are always, they're looking, um, they will be looking for um, applicants in the, in the near future. So please feel free to reach out about that as well for anybody that is interested in this space um, more. Yeah, thanks so much. Great, thank you, Ellery. Yeah, the Public Allies Program, I just, you know, very biased because I did it, but it's awesome. Um, it's it's basically the, an AmeriCorps program that plugs you in um, with local organizations, including non nonprofits, local governments. Um, but then one day a week is also dedicated to receiving trainings related to equity and justice and social cohesion. Um, and yeah, I, it changed my life. Um, and so very excited that uh, you know, I ended up here working with great folks like Sophie Margo and more. Um, yeah, I see we have another question. Um, so this is from Tim. I know more recent policy history, you mentioned redlining plays a role in your work. Have you considered how indigenous communities history plays a role in your work? And if so, what and how? And so, um, oh, Sophie, I see you pinged me. Um, if you want to speak to that first and then I can also share something as well. I think that's a really great question, Tim. In regards to climate safe neighborhoods, um, to be quite honest, uh, Ohio's indigenous communities history doesn't play a work in that a role in that work. And that's because, you know, with climate change in cities, we're starting with the built environment and the history behind the built environment and how um, there are disproportionate climate impacts within the way cities were built. And so we start our historical review along the lines of how these cities were built, um, which is more recent history. So I'll pass it off to Savannah. Great, thank you, Sophie. Yeah, no, I think that's a great explanation as why we're sort of starting with um, that 1920s through 1940s era of sort of the massive infrastructure uh, and federal and local policy decisions that have really shaped um, our cities to be the way they are. I know there's a lot of conversation, if any of y'all are on 
Twitter about um, highways, Federal Highway Administration, and just the history of how, you know, West End and what uh, used to be, um, you know, just extensive Black neighborhoods in Cincinnati were really um, overtaken by the processes of urban renewal. Um, built environment, but to answer your question, Tim, of, of how um, this could maybe plug into the broader conversation. Um, so we, you know, the Greater Cincinnati Native American Coalition um, is a Green Umbrella member and they participate every year um, in our Midwest Regional Sustainability Summit, as well as other programming um, that we, we host and that they host um, across the region. And they have programming dedicated to urban gardens. They have native land initiatives um, and they are very present um, in ensuring that, you know, land acknowledgements and key historical um, elements and stories are incorporated into the environmental and social justice scene here locally. They really are the leaders on this front. Um, and I remember, this was maybe three or four years ago, one of the very first um, Sunrise Cincinnati events um, featured Jerry, who is the director um, at the Native American Coalition. And we see them as being a key stakeholder group in the Regional Climate Collaborative moving forward. We um, hope to include their voice and their perspective um, in the creation of this group, as well as um, other, other groups that you know have, have not um, been mentioned yet today. So, you know groups that focus on working with differently abled um, or disability communities who are so often also not included um, in these conversations. Um, so groups like Starfire Council um, are a great resource for um, learning more about how to engage with communities and what can be included into policy conversations on this front. Um, and, you know, circle back to public allies. I was first introduced to, to Tim at Starfire Council um, through public allies and just, you know, that recognition piece of how um, some groups have really not been incorporated into certain policymaking processes. Um, so yeah, thank you for your question. I'm probably rambling now, but a really great call out for you know, how can these different groups um, plug into different parts of the story and um, what are the approaches to address certain needs? So like Sophie said, to address built environment um, right now, um, plugging in with certain history at the outset is has been our strategy. Um, I see another couple chats. All right, this was just information sharing from Margo and Ellery. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. And if there are any other questions, um, we've got a few more minutes. Feel free to unmute or drop in the chat. Otherwise, um, yeah, thank you so much for joining today. Um, what you'll see from us next is a follow-up email where you'll receive the slides and links to different resources that we shared today, as well as the registration for our next um, webinar in the series and some events that we mentioned, including the conference and the Regional Climate Collaborative launch. So thank you everyone and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day.